Hi everyone, welcome to the Sacred Musings podcast with me, Phil Saker. It's episode 123, it is the 4th of April, 24, and today we're looking at how to wake people up. So welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Uh, Over the last few weeks, a few people have mentioned to me about waking other people up. You know, it, it does seem really, really hard when you're speaking with people to actually, you know, help them to see what's going on in the world. And a lot of people seem very resistant to it. So how do we actually go about doing it? One of the things which I found is that there are, I think someone mentioned this to me last month, I think, or not recently, the parallels with evangelism, which is that, you know, it's very difficult for people to see the light of Christ And it's also very difficult for people to, you know, come to to understand the truth about what's been happening with COVID and all all of the other things that we've been talking about on the podcast for the last few years. So how do we actually get people to see? And that's something which I want to come on to in the podcast later, just looking at those parallels and what we can learn from from the Bible, what we can learn from um, evangelism and, and so on. Um, as obviously this kind of thing has been, you know, the church has been engaging with for a very long time. Um, but before we get on to that, I just like, as usual, to look at a few things which I've seen this week. Um, there's actually not too much this week, so hopefully this won't won't take too long. But I know um, a lot of people do appreciate this. So um, the first thing to mention is. Uh, this article here on the Daily Skeptic, which I think may have been published just after I recorded the podcast last week, but again about um, the Princess of Wales, about Catherine. The, uh, the article is called "Are We Being Gaslit Over the Cause of the Princess of Wales Cancer?" And this is really saying what I've been saying over the last few weeks, which is that it, you know, it, it's just more than a coincidence, isn't it, that Prince um, Prince Charles, that king, the king has has been diagnosed with cancer, and now Catherine, the Princess of Wales, who, and and this the article points out, has been the picture of health, you know, sporty and looking after herself, and so on and so forth, you know, that she's been the picture of health up until now, and yet now in her early forties, she is diagnosed with cancer. That's you know that's not normal. And you know, they make, they, the article makes the point that you know, the, this, I think the, the, the person who lived lived in a small town in Ireland and said when you know, in a small town or village, when uh, things happen to a number of people, it, it really notices you know, in a big city, then if, if a few more people get cancer or, or die than normal, you, you barely notice it. But in a small town, a small village, you notice. And in one family, particularly in one family, which is in the eye of the media, you notice. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought that was that was an interesting um, article, really saying a lot of the things that I've been saying. One of the things which I found most interesting about it, though, in fact, I'll, I'll scroll down and I'll, I'll show you the, the link here. Um, that um, William and, and Catherine did a video uh, urging people to get vaccinated. Now, I looked at this and this is part of an uh, sort of in the Zoom interview. I think they were talking to people who were clinically vulnerable and they were talking about the, the vaccine. And, um, and William in particular was saying, you know, well, I'm not a medical expert, but, you know, the, 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 there are the benefits of vaccination. What I thought was interesting about this is that in the video that they've um, clipped on the Daily Skeptic, it's only about um, uh, just over a minute long, that both William and Catherine are talking. But um, Catherine's segment is only a, a short bit. And, and I looked at the, the context of it. It's actually from an interview, from, from a wider interview, where she's not actually talking specifically about the vaccine. When William starts talking in, in this bit, I think she looks visibly uncomfortable. like As in, it seems to me that she's got a real question mark over whether they should be saying this. So I don't know whether there's anything in that. I mean, see what you think. She looks uncomfortable to me. I wonder if, you know, whether the the, the 
request came from on high, so to speak, you know, please, to, to them, please could you promote the vaccine, could you say this? And so they've gone on, they've gone on this Zoom call and, you know, Williams like had a script of whatever he's wanted to say. And maybe Catherine's felt uncomfortable with that um, because, you know, that the, they shouldn't be, and I think she's probably aware of this, shouldn't be promoting things like that. You know, they should be being neutral in these things. They shouldn't need to be promoting a vaccine. So, yeah, I, thought, I think it's, um, I thought that was an interesting um, little window anyway and um, do have a look at that and see what you think let me know what you think um, if you want to get in touch by the way I should I might as well say at this point do leave a comment below if you're watching this on YouTube if you're uh, watching this on my through my website you can uh, leave a comment below on my website you can also email me through via my website or telegram me and the links are all down below so uh, yeah do get in touch if you've got anything you want to add any comments anything that you'd like me to look at as well um, and I do appreciate everyone who's been in touch with me over the last um, the last few weeks and I, I might as well say as well while I'm here if you'd like to support the podcast there's a give send go and that's really just to, to support me and my family as um, you know this is uh, um, kind of like this is sort of work for me really um, and um yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated, but do have a look at the gifts and go, and I sort of explain a bit more about all of that. Okay, so that's that. Uh, next thing is, you may have seen what happened in Israel. This has been a big news story, that there were three, um, well, there were seven people who were killed by an Israeli missile or, or an Israeli attack. And there, was a, um, there were charity workers. Three, three of the people who were killed were Britons. And um, I think they were working for this charity bringing aid into Gaza. And the Israeli forces believed that there was a terrorist, um, you know, traveling with them. So they attacked and seven people died, including these three Britons. And a lot of people have been saying how this is Israel going over the top. Which I which I agree with really. Um, I mean, I, I think I've I've made my my feelings on on Israel. Um, I hope fairly clear. Which is again not in any way to defend Hamas. And there were a couple of points that I'd like to make about this. One was that um, the people were saying, you know, in in war, in the way that it, it would have been before, if there was. Uh, if there were seven terrorists with one innocent person traveling, you would hesitate before initiating a rocket attack or, or a missile attack or something. You know, you would you would hesitate before attacking them, lest you might hit the innocent person. But it seems like with the Israeli attack, it was the other way round. You know, they saw the innocent people as collateral damage to this one terrorist. W what do they think was going to happen? You know, it just seems like this it's the, almost this kind of over-the-top warmongering attitude. And this is the other thing that I was going to mention, that someone on, oh, I saw this via Twitter, someone was saying, someone official was saying that Hamas need to be wiped off the face of the earth, something like that. And again, it goes back to what we were looking at a few weeks ago on the podcast, how do we treat our enemies? I'm very uncomfortable with this kind of language. You know, that wiping people off the face of the earth. You know, that when we fought in the war, when we fought in the Second World War, Hitler needed to be defeated. But we didn't say we need to wipe Germany off the face of the earth. And, you know, it, it was one of these things that we needed to fight because he was the aggressor as well. It wasn't that, you know, we saw the rise of Nazism and then we just went over and said, right, we're going to send our forces over and, and stamp them out. It was because they were attacking them. I, I know that the situation with Hamas and with Israel is complicated. I know that Hamas have been aggressors. I know about the attacks on uh, October the 7th and so on. So I'm not trying to to justify Hamas or what they're doing. But it really does seem to me like when you're starting to say we need to wipe people off the face of the earth, to go back and say, hmm, is is there a better way here? You know, are we being violent? Is there is there a better way of looking at this? Because I I, I think there has to be. And this is the, the problem with the Western world at the moment, it seems like we just want to 
wipe our enemies off the face of the earth rather than actually convert, rather than actually bring people around to our way of thinking, rather than helping people. You know, we just want to, by, by military might, destroy them. And that's that's very, very worrying, I think, in terms of what's what's going on in the world. It is the new warmongers, as I mentioned um, some uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Okay, the next thing that I want to mention, again on Israel, and again, this is something which is, I mean, only a small thing in some respects, but the, the Armenian quarter in um, Patriarchate in Jerusalem um, the Armenian Christians issued a communique on the 3rd of April and it begins uh, today on April the 3rd 2024 around 11 o'clock an unlawful eviction was initiated by Israeli police on the grounds of the cow's garden located within the premises of the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The eviction began with the destruction of Armenian Patriarchate uh, property and assaults on clergy and indigenous Armenians. So it seems that um, Israel have been, uh, there was again, there has been a dispute going on in Jerusalem, but it, it seems that Israel have been involved in actually taking action. Now, it seems to me that I know that this is only a small thing, but it's just one of these things which I think is sym symptomatic of a bigger issue, which is this, this perhaps this sense of entitlement, you know, that, well, it, it's this, the identity politics thing. Well, because we're oppressed, because we've been oppressed, it justifies us in doing whatever we, you know, whatever we think is necessary to achieve our goals without the need to go through all the legal processes through due process, so on and so forth, and just war and, and so on. Now, it seems to me that what's happening in Israel is basically identity politics, the, the oldest kind of identity politics, you know, which is well, we've we've been victims. We suffered the Holocaust, um, a terrible, terrible thing, of course. Um, but then it it you know that's being used as a kind of a a justification. Um, and you know this is the problem that when you can when you can throw around accusations of anti-Semitism, then I think you can and you can silence people that way then you can virtually hide, can't you? You know, think you can get away with, with things like this and it's, and it's not right. So I think that we need to, like I said, uh, and I've, I've tr been trying to say on the podcast, you know, when it comes to Israel, as with any country, as with any group of people, we need to hold everyone to the same moral standards. You know, we do not have one set of standards for people who've been oppressed and another set of standards for people. Who've, you know, it, like that, that leads to identity politics. That leads to all the chaos that we're seeing in the world. You know, there is one, one moral standard and it applies to Jews, Gentiles, to every nation, to every nation under the sun. You know, there is one. It applies to Hamas and it applies to the West, applies to America and to Britain and, and everyone. And then we can hold ourselves up to that moral standard as well as our allies and their enemies. You know, that the, we're, we're not seen to be showing favoritism because there is only one kind of set of moral standards. Um, and, and I think that's what we need to be doing here. It's very, very difficult to do that when it comes to Israel because of the history, because of, you know, the accusations of anti-Semitism as well as the genuine anti-Semitism which is happening. But I think we have to try and uh, by God's strength, I think perhaps we will, you know, we will make progress in that. OK, uh, there's an article here on the uh, TCW Defending Freedom from um, today. Does Build Back Better Mean Controlled Demolition? Published by Neil McRae. And I thought this was a really helpful article. And it was looking at the Baltimore Bridge and was saying that the, you know, the, the Baltimore Bridge was struck by a ship and it collapsed. And it looks like this, again, this was some kind of, we, we don't know who or, or what exactly, but it looks like, again, it was some kind of intentional operation now, why would they be doing that? Um, what Neil McRae is arguing is this is part of a, a an operation against the country, really, you know, in the same way that so many of the other things that we've witnessed are happening against the country. And, you know, you think about uncontrolled migration and you think about what's been happening um, 
you know, with with finances and the na national debt, and so I mean, in so many ways, I think what we are witnessing is almost a war on on the people, and perhaps you could say it was a war on the people, and this is another move in it. But but I thought this was a really helpful article um, to look at, just in, in in many ways. Let me just quote you one paragraph, just to 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 kind of whet your appetite. Meanwhile, American culture is also being destroyed. The Black Lives Frenzy, uh, Black Lives Matter frenzy in 2020 was a shrill expression of critical race theory, with riots causing serious damage to inner cities. In California, stealing from shops has been decriminalised, with the unsurprising result that many stores have closed down. Mass illegal migration over the southern border is no accident, but a deliberate policy of the Washington administration, going far beyond the requirements of the UN Migration Pact. Subversive gender ideology is imposed by every institution. Joe Biden's message to the American people on the Easter holiday promoted Trans Visibility Day, a blasphemous act that could only be intended to provoke the Christian multitude. Oh yes, you, you, you may have seen this as well, that um, Joe Biden declared Easter Sunday to be Trans Visibility Day. And you know he, there was no way he could not have known that was Easter Sunday. So it was again another. Um, it's this pr provocative nature. It, it is. I think what we are witnessing actually is a war. You know, it's it's a deliberate demolition, as Neil McRae says. And I'm like I said last week. I'm not saying that you know this necessarily means that we will we will act uh, differently per se. But just knowing that, I think, helps to inform our actions. Knowing that what we're witnessing is not incompetence, but it's in some way a demolition job by who we don't know exactly. But it, it is in some way a demolition job. I think helps us to to stand up against it. You know, to know that we, we don't need to just vote in new politicians, but what we need actually is something more, a, a root and branch reform, actually. And I think just the, that knowledge itself is the first important step. Um, a couple more things here. So um, one was, um, both of these are, are Christian related. Um, so there was, a, this is a bit of encouraging news that Claire Craig, who I, um, I've mentioned many of the things that she's put out before, and I know that many of you will be aware of her too. She's been, she's a, a pathologist and she's been, you know, excellent through the um, through the COVID, you know, just exposing a lot of the problems and a lot of the, you know, um, establishment misinformation. Um, but she did this presentation. I think she initially did it in, in Parliament, but then has released it as a video. And she talks about how she came to to see through the the narrative when it came to covid but then the lovely thing at the end is that she talks about how a lot of people have asked her if she was a christian and she kind of talks about her own experience of coming to faith and i thought it was a really encouraging watch actually that um you know that the first part of the video if you're familiar with the work of of um, claire craig and, and the things that we're talking about you know, none of it will be new to you but at the end, you know, the last sort of five, ten minutes, she talks about her testimony, really. And I thought that was a really encouraging thing to listen to. And it's great that she's now got the courage to actually stand up and talk about this. You know, I think that she would call herself Christian now. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's something which a lot of people have been on that kind of journey over the last few um, over the last few years. So, yeah, really, really encouraging. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention before moving on to the main topic is a video which I did on Understand the Bible on my um, my other channel. This is called Stop Doing Evangelism, I'm Serious. And, um, over, you know, over the last few years, I've talked a lot about the church and about problems with the church. One of the major problems, I think, with the church, which is one of those problems which is... Um, uh, people don't really talk about much is the fact that the church is so some parts of the church are so focused on evangelism that they've neglected to do discipleship 
and that's effectively what my argument is. And if you want to understand what that is, then do have a look at the video. It's about 20 minutes. And I just explain it's I'm trying to, to help people who are in the church, kind of the established church and uh, or, or you know, say the established, not just the Church of England, but established churches to you know, to wake up to the fact that we've been going about things that we've ended up with a very shallow church, which is really through this intense focus on evangelism and not actually helping people to grow in their faith helping people to you know to build them up into you know in what christianity is and what it teaches and i think we've ended up with a very very shallow church and that's partly why we saw what we did over the last few years the church just completely caving in to the secular narrative and I, I do think there is a real problem there. Uh, so yeah, do have a watch of the video, maybe share it with the pastor of your church or the PCC or whoever, anyone who's willing to listen, as um, I think it's probably one of the most important things that I've, I've done on, uh, on Understand the Bible. And I really hope that people do listen to it. It helps to wake people up. And on that note, let's move on to the main topic, thinking about that question of how we can actually uh, wake people up to what's going on in, in the world. So how to wake people up. Now, this is something, as I said, this is something which Christians have been thinking a lot about over the centuries. Um, one of the things which uh, I think someone mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, commenting to me, that it's you know, trying to talk to people about what's going on in the world is a little bit like trying to talk to people about Jesus, you know, in the sense that people don't want to know. Now, the work that we do of evangelism is very similar to the work of, you know, trying to to wake people up to the, you know, all the, the, the nonsense that's been happening with COVID. It's just there's a, seems to be a real resistance there and that people just don't seem to want to know. Even actually Christians, it seems, don't don't want to know that they're just not not interested at all. They don't want to look into it. They just got their fingers in their ears. And what I thought it would be good to do in this session is to to look at some principles for actually helping to wake people up. And these are things which Christians have been um, thinking about for a long time. Um, but the first thing that I wanted to talk about was, is that a valid thing to to draw that comparison? You know, is it valid to say uh, that there are parallels between trying to wake people up to to Christ and trying to wake people up to the truth about, you know, COVID and, and all, all of these other things? Um, so let me quote to you here. This is a passage from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. I think I've mentioned this before, but I think this is relevant. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through the signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So you see here that there is that that uh, the truth and the lie are opposites and the truth is linked with Christ, whereas the lie is linked with Satan, you know, the powerful delusion. And it seems to me that what we are living through is this time of powerful delusion. And I think that the, the delusion is that is secular, secularism, you know, that there is no God, that there is no ultimate right and wrong, that this life is all there is, and that the elites are our ultimate authorities, that you know, they are our protectors and our saviours. And this is what we find actually in the book of Revelation, that it is the, um, you know, the, the, the there is this kind of beast, the which is the the secular, humanist authorities, who think that you know they are the substitute gods. They they get round to thinking they are gods, and this is how it works. It seems. So I think that you know the the 
there is a, a parallel there between Christ and the truth and, you know, what's happening in the world. Um, and waking people up is kind of both and, which is why I think you get people like Claire Craig who have perhaps woken up to what's going on in the world in one area and, and have then sought Christ in, in, in that area. And it's because those things are linked. Um, so I think that people will only seek out the gospel message once they've stopped believing in the government being our saviour. You know, I think that believing in Christ in, will involve stopping believing in the government as our saviour. And on that note, I'd just like to add, I think there are going to be a lot of very disappointed people on the day of judgment who've gone to church their whole lives and yet who have, you know, just gone along with this secular message of the government being our saviour. I think there are going to be a lot of people who are very disappointed on that day. And, you know, to, to, to actually believe in, in Jesus does not mean, you know, just believing and then doing nothing about it. But it actually means we have to live by faith. And that's something which, um, well, I've, I've tried to come onto on the podcast and we'll come back to that. Um, so what principles are there in terms of waking people up? Um, there are five that I wanted to mention. I'm sure there are many more that we could talk about, but um, these are five main ones which I wanted to, to mention. Uh, love and compassion, patience, recognising our own limitations, wisdom, and showing the goodness of the truth. So these are five things that I wanted to mention when it came to how to, to wake people up. So let's go through those in turn. Firstly, about love and, and compassion. Uh, now, it is possible to want people to come to the truth for the right reasons or the wrong reasons. I think that the wrong reason would be because we want to be proved right or we want to just the pleasure of winning winning an argument. Now, I can recognise the power of that and I'm afraid that I am more than guilty of that sometimes that when it comes especially online you know but it's very easy to just for things to become abstract and you care more about winning the argument than you do about winning the person and that's really not helpful and healthy and that doesn't actually show care for someone so we have to be careful not to just want to win an argument but not actually win a person um I think, though, it is possible to want someone to come to the truth because we do genuinely care about them and because we don't want to see them going down the road of living in fear and all of the, the things, the bad things which are coming, that we do genuinely care about people and want to see them, you know, uh, see good for them. So that's the right reasons to be to be concerned about the truth and concerned to see other people live by the truth and I think we can ask ourselves the question do we look down on people who are less enlightened uh, so to speak or do we actually care about them this is how Jesus did it this is a verse from Matthew Matthew 9 36 when he Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on them and that's what we should be like as well you know that recognizing that people are bound up chained up in this so rather than looking down on them and I put a picture of that uh, up there um, if you're watching of a sheep and sometimes I've heard the, I've heard the phrase sheeple you know they're just sheeple and I, I don't think that's a very pleasant way of referring to people, actually, who are caught up in, in the lies. I think we need to, to have compassion on people. So what will, that, what will that mean? Well, if we care for them, if we love them, have compassion on them, then it means that we need to be patient with them. Remember what it says, um, that famous passage about love from 1 Corinthians 13. One of the things, or the first thing, in fact, that love is, is patient love is patient 
There's a, a good verse I found here from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 25, 15. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Uh, I really like that, that to, to persuade a, a king or a ruler takes patience, that, you know, it's not, Rome was not built in a day. And even it says a gentle tongue can break a bone, you know, that a gentle tongue can achieve more than violence uh, sometimes. And we need to remember that, that if people are not moving at the speed that we want them to, we need to be patient and we need to be gentle. And that is how we win people round, not by violence, not by threats, but but by patience. Um, you know, just, just encouraging people to seek the truth and, you know, just, just speaking to people about it as we have the opportunity. Um, this is what it says. Um, part of the, the way we can do that is by remembering the way that it was for us. This is what it says in uh, Ephesians 4 verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And we need to remember that people will come in their own time and that's not necessarily the timing that we would like. And if, for, if I myself, you know, I look back over the last four years and I think when you know, before the before uh, COVID started, and I know I've shared my journey before, before COVID started, I was really, really naive about everything that was happening. And I think I, I just didn't, I didn't have a clue, to be quite honest, what was going on. And um, and I think over the last few years, my eyes have really been open to everything. And I, I'm i certainly, I think, much more aware now than I was. At the same time, it has taken me quite a long time to get to this point. So I've been very grateful for people who've been patient with me. And I know that there have been people who... I think there were people who used to listen to Sacred Musings or, you know, listen to me before it was Sacred Musings, who I think gave up with me uh, because I, I, I wasn't, you know, more down the, you know, um, the conspiracy line, uh, if I might call it. I, I don't like calling it conspiracy because, you know, it sounds like conspiracy theorist and it sounds false, but you know what I mean. We've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Um, so I'm grateful for people who've shown me patience, basically, and I, I want, therefore, to try and show other people that same patience, even if you know when they're not up to where I, I would like them to be. Um, so the third thing then is recognizing our own limitations. Now this is something um, again, those those of us who've tried to evangelize to others you know that sometimes it's like talking to a brick wall that people just put their fingers in their ears and don't want to listen well this is again exactly what what is predicted um, so let me quote you from Zechariah chapter 7 verses 11 and 12 but they refuse to pay attention stubbornly they turn their backs and cover their ears they made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. I like that they refused to pay attention. They covered their ears. They turned their backs. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to, the, to God's words. This is what, what people do. You know, that, that people do harden their hearts against the words of God. And it's something which I used to see this actually when I was preaching sometimes in church. If we had a, um, people coming in, for example, we had a, a baptism, an infant baptism, you would get a you know flooded with a family who were or, or you know people who were not not used to church, who were not Christians, and you know I would sometimes when I was preaching I would try to to talk about you know, heaven and hell and talk about trusting in Jesus. And you could just see people, the, the look that came over people's faces. It was just, I'm, I don't want to know. I don't, don't talk to me about this. I don't want to know. Um, and, and this is the thing, you know, that, that people have that capacity 
to just harden their hearts, to just, you know, I don't want to, I'm living my life. Don't talk to me about God. I don't want to know. But there is good news even for, for those people. This is what it says in Isaiah 42 verses 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Oh, this is a prophecy about the Messiah, prophecy about Jesus. Jesus applied these, these words to himself. And uh, God says that, amongst other things, he would be a light to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now, that seems very like what's going on at the moment, doesn't it? You know, a uh, open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, release th from the dungeon those in darkness. That's what we need to happen. And that's something that God can do, that God can open eyes that are blind. Even though people cover their eyes and don't want to see, God can enable them to see and God can change their hearts. So that is something which is encouraging that even the hardest of hearts, God is capable of changing. You think about the, the Apostle Saul, for example, who um, he was breathing, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's people. And yet God was able to, to break through. Jesus came to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and it completely changed his life. We, we called it a, Damasc a Damascus Road moment, and, and that can happen. So, you know, even the hardest of hearts can be changed. That's something. But, but we need to recognise that that's a work of God, not of us. And this is the point here that there is a limit to what rational argumentation can do. And I'm sure that you and I, we've both hit that, that you're trying to talk to someone and it's like the, the veil comes down, the wall comes down, you just can't get through. And, you know, people will refuse to, to listen. And at that point, we can't do anything. All we can do is, as the song goes, you know, take it to the Lord in prayer. I think that's the only option when we're dealing with people who will not listen is just commit them to prayer because unless there's a change of heart, there won't be, a, you know, no argument can actually make a difference. And, you know, this is something about human nature, which is fundamental, that so much of so much of our existence, it, you know, we think we're rational beings, but we are not. And when you've dealt with people for a while, you realise this, don't you? That people are emotional, people rationalise what they want to be true rather than actually thinking through um, what they what is actually the case and working it out. You know, people rationalise and people just go with their, you know, their sort of gut feeling, which often um, is not... Well, actually, I don't think people do go with their gut feeling. I think they just go with their, you know, uh, go away from their gut feeling in fact um if, if that kind of makes sense you know but it's it, what i'm saying is it's not a conscious choice it's an unconscious one um so the next thing then is wisdom we need to have given what we've said we need to have wisdom in how we actually engage with people given that it's not all about rational argument we need to have wisdom and recognize that some people will listen and other people are not going to listen for some people, the veil will lift and other people it's not going to. So we need to, to focus on people who are going to listen. And it seems to me that this was Jesus's strategy as well. Let me quote to you a bit from John chapter 6, uh, verses 60 to 63. And these are verses which I've always found fascinating um, and very different to the way that we normally go about things. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. So Jesus tells them, 
teaches them something and they say, uh, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? So they're grumbling about it. But Jesus doesn't say, well, oh, well, I'll make it a bit easy for you then. He says, does it offend you? Well, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? You know, so I have the authority to say this as the Son of Man. He says, the Spirit gives life, the flesh flat counts for nothing. The words I have spoken are full of the Spirit and life. That he has spoken words which are full of the Spirit and life, so they should accept them. And what they're reacting against is actually the, the Spirit and the life which is spoken to them. So Jesus doesn't mince his words. He doesn't tone it down for them. He gives it to them straight. And if they don't accept it, then they, they've not accepted the words of truth. And I think that's helpful for us because so often in the Christian life, we think we just need to give people a gentle version of Christianity to start with. And then as they get more into it, and I think, no, 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 no. We need to give people the full fat, complete Christianity saying, look, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to be willing to die for him, you know, because he's worth it. You know, that, that that's the thing. We need to be prepared to say that up front, in fact, I think, to people, because that's what Jesus did. You know, he, as um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it, you know, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And that's at the point of calling him. You know, that's not something which is further down the road. And um, if Jesus was prepared to do that, I think we should we should be too. So not sugarcoating, you know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't sugarcoat the truth. Um, and we should also be prepared to um, recognize when people are not listening. So this is what Jesus said elsewhere, Matthew chapter seven verse six: Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do. They may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And what I think Jesus is saying, for a long, long time, this passage puzzled me. But I think what Jesus is saying here is that we should be prepared to turn away from people if they're not listening. Now, we should be prepared to, to withhold if we recognise that, that the veil is not is still there, if you know, that people are not showing any signs of interest, but only rejecting the truth, then we should walk away. And yeah, it's difficult when the people, those people are our family, are our friends. And, you know, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't speak to them at all or anything like that. But, you know, there does come a moment where I think we do have to, to, to some degree, walk away. And exactly what that looks like will be dependent on those circumstances. But I think we need that wisdom you know, so that we can focus on those people who are interested and who are seeking the truth. OK, this is the fifth and final thing that I was going to, to talk about, which is showing the goodness of the truth. And um, this is a verse here from Titus 2, verse 10. So that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our saviour, attractive. And I think the old the older translations say adorn the gospel, adorn the gospel, which I think is a lovely way of putting it. And what this says to me is that the gospel message is not just about what we believe. It's about how we live. It's about our behavior. And what we need to do is, as I've heard it said, live in such a way as to make an atheist question their atheism. Now, in other words, we need to live in a way where other people look at our lives and say, there's something wrong with my life. There's something which is not enough with my life. And I think this is something the church has actually been very bad at doing over the, the last, oh, I don't know, certainly a few decades I don't think the church has been living differently enough from the world. The world and the church have looked very, very similar. Um, but this is this is the thing with the truth. You know, the truth, it's not just true, but it works. That it's actually better to live our lives by the truth than to live by a lie. And we need to we need to uh, allow it to make a difference to our lives, to make a difference to the way that we live. And it should be apparent to those who are watching us 
that living by the truth is the best way of living. And if we live in a way which is fearful, you know, fearful of authoritarianism or anything like that, we're not showing the best way of living by the truth. Now, you think about during COVID when people were encouraged just to basically, you know, put a mask on, stay away from other people, live in fear. The best witness, I think, in that situation would have been to to actually just get together, say, no, it doesn't matter. You know, let's give each other a hug. Let's not wear masks. Let's have human contact. Let's not fear what might happen. And let's not live in fear. And, and we will show the goodness of that. And I think that would have been a very powerful uh, witness. Um, unfortunately, a lot of churches, the vast majority, did not do that. Um, this is... The, one of the interesting things about what we call evangelism i'm sorry by the way it's just started raining quite heavily so i'm sorry if that comes across one of the interesting things about evangelism is that the bible doesn't really have much to say about how to talk to people about jesus but rather it seems to that the emphasis is on living differently so that people will notice this is what it says in um uh, oh, I haven't put the reference down there. I think this is I think this is one Peter. I can't remember the, the chapter and verse. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So I think the New Testament just seems to assume rather than us necessarily going out and, and with a big placard saying believe in Jesus actually seems to suggest that it's the way that we live that will make the difference. And at the end of the day, that's that's what people read, isn't it? That's the gospel that people read. The gospel people read is, is the life of people like you and me, Christians, the life of the church. And if they're looking at us and thinking, well, that looks just like my life. So what have they got, which is so good? In fact, it looks worse than my life because they're so unhappy and miserable all the time. Then we're not we're not adding anything, are we? But if if, on the other hand, people look at the church and say, wow, that's the kind of place I want to be. What, what have they got? Because I want some of that. Then I think that that adorns the gospel that shows where God really is. And, and that's something I think that the church has been. Well, I think the church has been pretty pathetic, actually, at doing that. Um, completely failed, really, over the last few years. There are pockets of, of uh, you know, of that. Um, but by and large, it, it's not been the case. So let me summarise then briefly about, about this. Uh, we need to speak the truth in love with wisdom. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't be embarrassed. So, obviously, if there are people who don't want to hear, then, you know, we, we won't go there. But I don't think we need to be embarrassed about speaking the truth about what's happening in the world with COVID, with the Great Reset, with Agenda 2030, all of those things. Don't be embarrassed. Don't sugarcoat it. Just speak according to how you feel. Trust that God will give you the words. Ask him to give you wisdom in doing that. Um, but we need to speak the truth in love for people. Secondly, we should lean in to those who show an interest and a desire to know more, but keep a distance from those who are hardened. Um, one of the things which I, I used to think with evangelism was almost like if someone showed an interest, it was almost like it was cheating to want to spend more time with them and to want to follow up. And I think what a ridiculous thing to, to think, you know, like if, if you make a connection with someone, if there's opportunities then then pursue it you know there's nothing wrong that's that, that's a good thing that's from god if on the other hand there are people who you know that you feel are hardened and just don't want to listen then you don't have to dedicate so much of your time to trying to persuade them you know just just work on as it were people who who actually seem willing to listen that's what I would say. Just focus on people who seem willing to listen. That seems to be the God-given way of doing this, that where God is, people will, will start to listen. Thirdly, pray for God to give you wisdom 
and that he would open the eyes of the blind. Just recognising really that nothing of this can be done in our own strength just by better arguments. But we need to trust God to open people's eyes and we need to trust God to, to help us to have the right words to say. So um, don't, I say, don't forget to pray. You know, the, the, it, there's a verse in the Bible which just says pray continually. And I think that's that's the big thing. Just everything is about prayer. You know, remember that um, we need to pray for, for, for the words to say. We need to pray for people. Um, you know, we need to pray that God would give us love for others. All of that, that's really, really important. Prayer is fundamental and foundational. And the final thing is enjoy living in accordance with the truth. That if we are only worried about the big things happening in the world, then we're not going to adorn the gospel. You know, that we need to be those who actually um, actually enjoy the truth, living in the truth. And yes, sometimes it means that we might get in trouble with the authorities, but that's what happened to the apostles. And that didn't you know, rob them of their joy, did it? You know, that, that actually that God's ways, the ways of the truth are the best ways to live. And so that's what we need to do. So uh, I hope that that has been helpful to you in thinking about how to uh, to wake people up. I do think there are real um, there is a, definitely a spiritual component to all of this, um, the truth and, and delusion and so on. So I think it is quite right to be thinking about how waking people up both to the truth and to the the truth of the gospel. Um, and um, you know I think there is an overlap, if you like, between those things. So do let me know. Anyway, what you what uh, your thoughts on that? Do let me know if there's anything that you found helpful, uh, any stories that you've you've got of um, you know people who've um, come to faith, and you know I think it's just encouraging to hear that actually that you know God is capable of breaking through, and and that you know things are happening, and I, I think things really are happening at the moment actually, um, but we just need to yeah, to be patient. Uh, going back to my point there, the second point. So the for the final um, Bible verse, I thought that we could have this reading here from 1 Samuel chapter 5. Now, I was thinking about this because I was thinking about Islam and thinking, you know, is Islam a threat? And people, sometimes people say that, particularly, you know, on the, the right, that Islam is a threat. And it just... For some reason, this passage kind of popped into my head. This is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, I'll just actually read the whole chapter. It's not very long. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remains. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and inflicted them with tumours. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the Ark of the God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumours. So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. As the Ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the Ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the Ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumours, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. 
Now, I think this passage is, it's one of those passages actually in the Old Testament, which I think has a kind of dark humour to it. You know, that the, the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, had captured the ark, and as a kind of symbol of their triumph, uh, the god Dagon over the god of Israel, they, they had brought it into their temple. And what happens? Well, Dagon falls down, they've got the idol, falls down before it one night. The next night, they, well, they put it back up. The next night, it's fallen down, but this time the arms and legs are broken off. And and then they're afflicted with tumours, so they think, oh, what are we going to do? We move it to another another city. No, that's afflicted with tumours too. So they move it to another city, and it's just this panic. And it, it really made me think of that. I think there's a quote from Charles Spurgeon, which is, you know, defend the Bible, I'd soon as defend the lion. I just think God is quite capable of defending himself. God is quite capable of making it clear, uh, you know, who, who is obeying him and who his friends are, who his enemies are. God does not need our help with that. What we need to do is to trust in him. And our job is actually to, you know, what well, to repent and believe. That's that's the thing that we need to do. You know, that Islam is not a threat. I don't think, you know, in the same, it was only a threat in as much as the Philistines were a threat to the Israelites, which, as it turns out, was only because the Israelites stopped trusting in the Lord. And it's the same with us. I think what's happening to us today in this country has been because we've turned away from the Lord. But actually, there is no, there's no danger with God. You know, that if we turn to him, then it is... Uh, you know, we, we have nothing to, to worry about from Islam or any other religion. It's only about believing and trusting in God. That is the thing that, uh, and believing and trusting in Jesus, that is the thing which will, which will protect us, you know, because he is the one who protects us at the end of the day. And uh, you know, it's helpful to think, isn't it, that as the government are trying to take more of our trust and the government are trying to divide us more, that they're actually... They're actually doing Satan's work. Um, and, we, you know, what what we need to do is actually to be encouraged to trust in God. And, uh, you know, as we trust in Jesus, that is the that's the answer. So I hope that that's that's helpful. My little reflection is helpful to you. Um, uh, do have a, a read of that, of that whole section. I mean, I think, you know, God is perfectly capable of defending himself. And uh, God is more than capable of showing who who belongs to him and where his favour lies. And in, in Understand the Bible, on the sermons I've been preaching, going through Exodus, again, how God brings the people of Israel out of Egypt, you know, from under Pharaoh's hands. You know, he demonstrates his power that we have no reason to fear with the God who is able to to rescue his people from from darkness and from authoritarian rulers from other religions you know everyone god has god has the power so let's take a moment to pray and ask for his help uh, as we face whatever we're facing over this this coming week heavenly father we do thank you that you are a god uh, the god with power that at the end of the day idols are nothing and that the idols of men are are just just that they are nothing and they have no power. We know, Lord, that you are capable of doing more than we can ask or imagine. And we pray that you would help us to trust you. And we pray, Lord, that in our time that you would help us to, uh, that you would cause many people to turn to you, that we would see that in our time, Lord, many people turning to you. And we pray that you would uh, use us as part of your plans in any way that you choose and uh, I and uh, I know I'm sure we'd all want to offer ourselves to you, that you would use the things that we can say and do uh, for your um, for your glory and for the good of others in helping them to understand the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about uh, what's going on in the world. So we pray these things, trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me today. I should have said earlier, but just to mention, I will be away next week, so there will be no podcast next week. I'll have a break um, of a week, but then I'll be back in a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, um, uh, do have a look. I'm on Twitter, and I'll be uh, I do uh, post up things on there from time to time. But yeah, apart from that, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Don't forget to get in touch with me and uh, uh, look at the Gifts and Go as well if you're able to. And uh, if you'd like to, that's down below, all the links and everything. So thanks so much, everyone. God bless. And I'll see you again soon.